Welcome. My name is Ken Bamberger and I'm a professor here at the law school. I'd like to welcome you to Cyber Hate, Defining and Combating Antisemitism and Hate Online, a symposium at Berkeley Law co-sponsored by the Berkeley Program on Jewish Law, Thought and Identity and the Berkeley Center for Law and Technology. This two-part symposium will explore the phenomenon of cyber hate. The first session today, titled Translating Hate in the Digital World, will define the scope of the problem of cyber hate and its manifestations, with a particular focus on religion, race, and gender. The format for today is as follows. The symposium will begin with a keynote overview by Chris Wolf. He will then be joined by our team of experts for the day to discuss the issues in greater depth. The panel includes Carrie Goldberg, founder of the CA Goldberg Law Firm, Professor Danielle Citrin of the University of Virginia Law School, and Vlad Kakin of the Anti-Defamation League. We learned late on Tuesday, unfortunately, that Stephanie Ortiz is not able to be with us today. And we're incredibly grateful to Danielle Citron for joining our panel with this late notice. Before I introduce Chris Wolf, a few housekeeping issues. First, please look in the chat for the MCLE signup sheet. We'll also be posting a link in the chat to the MCLE certificate of attendance. These will both be Google Docs. Second, please note that this is the first of two sessions. The second session, Combating Online Hate, Law, Technology, and Society will take place a month from now, March 4th, at the same time. It will examine remedies and responses to online hate and will include another fantastic panel of speakers. Please also look for the link in the chat to the symposium webpage. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Chris Wolf. Chris is a dear friend and mentor of those of us at Berkeley Law and the Berkeley Center for Law and Technology. He's one of the few American lawyers who've made the fight against online hate a pro bono priority. And he's been leading the fight for over 25 years. Chris is what MSNBC has called a pioneer in internet law because he's also one of the first lawyers focusing on the internet as an area of practice, leading to his specialization in privacy law since the earliest days of that area of the law. And he founded the think tank Future of Privacy Forum. Chris currently is senior counsel emeritus at Hogan Lovells in Washington, DC, where he was previously partner and founder of their privacy and cybersecurity practice. In 1988, Chris volunteered for the Anti-Defamation League and rose within the leadership ranks. He's currently on the National Board of Directors. In 2013, he, with ADL National Director Abe Foxman, co-authored the book Viral Hate, containing its spread on the internet, a capstone to their work together in the fight against online hate. Chris, welcome. Thank you very much, Ken, for that uh, generous introduction. And hello from Washington, DC. I'm really pleased to have been invited to keynote today's program and kudos to Berkeley for organizing this two-part symposium on how to define and combat online anti-Semitism and hate. It's certainly a timely and important topic. My role today is to start the discussion on the scope and breadth of the problem. And after this introduction, I'll be joined by uh, Carrie, Vlad, and Danielle, who, who will dig deeper into the problem of recognizing and understanding online hate. And I look forward to be joining, joined by them shortly. There will also be an opportunity for Q&A uh, uh, in our panel. And so if you have questions, please use the, uh, the chat box or the question box to ask them and uh, one of our moderators will feed them to, to the panel. So today we will be diagnosing the problem of online hate and part two of the symposium will address remedies. Let me start by thanking the Berkeley Institute's program on Jewish law, thought and identity and the Berkeley Center for Law and Technology for, for sponsoring this symposium. 
I want to especially thank my old friend Ken Bamberger for recommending me and for hosting today. And thanks to Rebecca Goldberg, the Institute's Executive Director, for her hard work in making today happen and for being so gracious about it. It's been my great pleasure over many years to travel to Berkeley and to participate in a range of programs there. Uh, indeed, on one of the last trips I made before lockdown was to Berkeley Law to speak to Ken Bamberger's class on the practice of privacy law. And afterwards, Ken and his wife very generously took me to dinner to Chez Panisse, which was a real treat for this foodie. And how I wish I was in California today, not simply to avoid the snow and not uh, just for the food, but to see old friends and for the connection that comes with in-person conferences. Berkeley conferences are the best, and uh, but the pandemic, what it is, will make the most of Zoom. And coincidentally, just this week, I spoke by a Zoom to a Berkeley Law Privacy class taught by Professor Paul Schwartz. So engaging with law school was a nice habit for me. What I'd like to do in the half hour or so allotted to me is sketch out the relationship between the expansion of the internet, including especially social media, and the proliferation of online hate. I'll share with you some startling statistics on how people are affected by online hate, and I'll discuss one pernicious area of online hate that often is overlooked having to do with online gaming. I'll talk a little bit about recent decisions of the Facebook Oversight Board, decisions that show how difficult it can be to apply definitions of hate to content. And I'll share some exciting news about a joint research program undertaken by the Anti-Defamation League in partnership with the Berkeley D-Lab producing an online hate index that will allow platforms to discover correlations between certain types of hate speech and categories of haters. Let me start, however, by discussing, uh, by telling you a little bit about uh, my journey into the fight against online hate. Almost 41 years ago, I graduated from law school uh, and after a clerkship embarked on a, a career of litigation. And my practice was that of a generalist litigator in a big firm, ranging from antitrust, international trade, to copyright. For the first 15 years of my career, I was open to almost any kind of case. And I used to joke that my tombstone would read, he died with his options open. As luck would have it, I snagged as a client MCI, the telecom firm that toppled AT&T, and ended up trying a protracted case in San Jose involving an internet technology development dispute. That was in 1993, before the internet was rolled out to consumers. We had lots of experts in that case explaining how the internet packets of information would be transferred at the speed of light, and how hundreds of millions of people could access the same information at the same time. It seemed incredible at the time when the video game Pong was state of the art in most people's homes, like mine. I came home from that trial and I said to anyone who would listen, I think this internet is gonna be something. I just wish I had translated that sentiment to my investment account. I decided then and there that I would become an internet lawyer. There was no ABA section devoted to internet law. So I simply dubbed myself an internet lawyer and undertook to research and write as much as I could on the subject in my spare time. My articles and speaking gigs led to some interesting cases such as representing the Washington Post in an online copyright challenge brought by the Church of Scientology. At the same time I was morphing from a generalist litigator to an internet lawyer, my career as a volunteer lay leader for the Anti-Defamation League was developing. Civil rights has always been a passion of mine and ADL's mission to combat anti-Semitism and promote justice and fair treatment for all resonated with, with me then as it still does today. In Washington DC, my hometown, I rose to become ADL's regional board chair and at the national level, level in 1995, I convinced then National uh, Director Abe Foxman to focus on the potential of the emerging internet to foster anti-Semitism and hate of all kinds. And I volunteered to lead that effort. Even in 1995, the internet had a dark side and it's only gotten worse by several orders of magnitude with the expansion of social media tools. The ease with which information is shared comes with a price. Every day, individuals and groups use the power of the internet as a weapon to spread vitriol aimed at racial, ethnic, religious, and sexual minorities and other targets. Calls for violence, bigoted rants, lies, bullying, and conspiracy uh, circulate openly on the internet with effects on individuals and society that are profound and dangerous. Even though ADL had issued a report in the 1980s about the use of dial-up bulletin boards by extremists, its focus for decades since its founding in 1913 had been on traditional ways hate groups communicated, such as with plain brown envelopes and meeting down dark alleys. The idea that extremists would use technology as a principal means of pursuing their hate-filled goals was new. 
Today, it's commonplace and a principal focus at ADL. ADL quickly came to lead the focus on internet hate here and abroad. I became chair of the International Network Against Cyber Hate and represented ADL at programs in Israel and, in, and across Europe. One of my more memorable trips was to Par a Paris conference hosted by the government of France. At one panel, I was asked why the US Congress didn't criminalize certain hate, hate speech as was done in France and Germany. I explained how most hate speech was not and could not be illegal because of the broad license granted by the First Amendment. That's why speech illegal in Europe was showing up on websites hosted in the US. I wasn't exactly going out on a limb with that answer in terms of constitutional law. Still, a former French Minister of Justice yelled out from the back of the room, stop hiding behind the First Amendment. I didn't realize that's what I was doing. In any event, I don't think an amendment to the Constitution was likely or that I could play any role in its passage. Just this week in an article for the New York Times Magazine, Emily Bazelon reiterated that the First Amendment sets a very high bar for punishing inflammatory words. She cited University of Chicago professor Jeffrey Stone who has written that the Supreme Court press precedent wildly overprotects free speech from any logical standpoint but that the court learned from experience to guard against a worse evil, the government using its power to silence its enemies. Back in the US, as Ken mentioned, my work with the now retired Abe Foxman culminated in our writing a book about online hate in 2013. And in the book, we said that the online hate we are witnessing could fairly be labeled viral hate, which happens to be the title of the book. And if we, were right, if we were to write an update to the book today, we would observe that as with the virus causing the COVID-19 pandemic, viral hate online is mutating. Unlike its physical cousin, however, there is no vaccine to combat the virus of online hate. I'm still involved with the league today as a member of the National ADL Board of Directors, and I'm proud to say that ADL Center for Technology and Society is a leader in the fight against online hate. In preparing for today's program, I went back and reread what we wrote in Viral Hate. Since almost eight years has passed since the publication, an update such as the one I just referred to probably is in order, probably all that has happened in the world of Twitter and with the internet inspired violence of Charlottesville and at the US Capitol. Still, the introduction to chapter one of our book continues to resonate. And with your indulgence, I wanna read with you a little of what we wrote back then as a way to kick off uh, today's program. We wrote, in February 2009, the US Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, DC mounted an unusual exhibit. Building on the museum's mandate to document and memorialize the murder of 6 million Jews, it, it, its exhibit entitled State of Deception fo focused on the power of Nazi propaganda. It traced Hitler's program of extermination back to its roots in the manipulation of German mass media and popular culture. The exhibit showed how the Nazi propaganda machine used the media of the day, movies, posters, newspapers, magazines, books, pamphlets, and paintings to skillfully spread lies about Jews and to reignite and perpetuate centuries old anti-Semitic stereotypes. It also showed how the Nazis crafted racist messages that were more nuanced and subtle than one commonly recalls, messages that were designed to persuade and ultimately desensitize the general pop population not just fanatical followers. Thus, State of the Deception showed how Nazi propaganda helped create a nationwide climate of hatred, suspicion, and indifference that ultimately laid the groundwork for Hitler's final solution. One Nazi-sponsored painting in the exhibit effectively showed the power of deceitful and incendiary, incendiary words, depicting a youthful Hitler giving a speech before a handful of captivated followers. The painting was titled, In the Beginning Was the Word, an apt description of the almost magical power of words of propaganda to produce unimaginable evil. The evil of the Nazi regime was vanquished almost 70 years ago, but the power of words and images to, to propagate hate remains a force of evil in our wor world. Today, there are powerful new tools for spreading lies, fomenting hatred and encouraging violence. Ironically, they are the same tools that have enriched society by creating new ways to communicate, educate and entertain. They are the tools of the internet. In a little more than 20 years, the internet has blossomed as a way to connect the world, but at the same time, the openness and wide availability of the internet we celebrate sadly has allowed it to become a powerful and virulent platform, not just for anti-Semitism, but for many forms of hatred that are directly linked to growing online incivility, to the marginalization and targeting of minorities, to the spread of falsehoods that threaten to mislead a generation of young people, 
to political polarization and to real, real world violence. Hitler and the Nazis could never have dreamed of such an engine of hate. Online anti-Semites are joined by Islamophobes, racists, misogynists, homophobes, and other kinds of vicious haters. haters. Turn, over, turn over a single rock in this netherworld of the internet, and you may be amazed by the number and variety of repellent attitudes and threats that suddenly become visible. The most virulent hate mongers are joined by a growing number of normally right-minded people who employ the shield of online anonymity to say hateful, horrible, hurtful, and hateful things in, a com in comment sections and elsewhere across the internet, adding to the deterioration of civil discourse. Of course, the new technology of propaganda exhibits some dramatic differences from the old. Instead of being under the, the central control of a political party or group, the power of the internet lies in its viral na nature. Everyone can be a publisher, even the most vicious anti-Semite, racist, bigot, homophobe, sexist, or purveyor of hatred. The ease and rapidity with which websites, social media pages, video and audio downloads, and instant messages can be created and disseminated online make internet propaganda almost impossible to track, control, and combat. Links, viral mails, and retweets enable lies to self-propagate with appalling speed. Hate begets hate, and its widespread appearance makes it seem increasingly acceptable and normal in a world where traditional standards of honesty, tolerance, and civility are rapidly deteriorating. That's what we wrote in 2013. We were commenting on the amazing difference between the world of web 1.0 with static internet pages and little opportunity for internet engagement and the world of social media that predominates today. On Tuesday of this week, Adam Clark Estes wrote a piece for Recode on Vox entitled, How Neo-Nazis Use the Internet to Instigate a Right-Wing Extremist Crisis. In his articles, he wrote, quoting now, white supremacists have historically been early to technological trends, sometimes even shaping how mainstream Americans experience them. Consider that The Birth of a Nation, considered an, an influential 1915 film by D.W. Griffith, based on a 1905 novel called The Klansman, and credited with reviving the Ku Klux Klan, was the first film to be shown at the White House. One could argue that almost a century later, tech-savvy white supremacists played a critical role in putting Trump in the White House. And from the beginning, they seemed to know just how powerful and transformative the internet would be. I agree, of course, and it's always seemed that haters have been early adopters, as we observed in our book in 1913, uh, 1913 and as Recode reconfirmed this week. In fact, this week's Recode piece made this chilling observation, quote, the communication structure has evolved dramatically since a few ambitious neo-Nazis plugged their computers into dial-up modems and built the early networks of hate. Being an extremist is a mobile multimedia ex uh, experience now, thanks to smartphones, social media, podcasts, and live streaming. And it's not just the leaderless resistance strategy that has endured among right-wing extremists. A number of neo-Nazi themes, namely those drawn from a racist dystopian novel from the 1970s called The Turner Diaries, have also transcended the decades of technological advance to crop up again during the Capitol riot in January, unquote. If we're going to combat the advancement of online hate, it makes sense, doesn't it, that we should define our terms. That's me speaking. If advocates are going to ask Facebook and Twitter to take down hate-filled content, there needs to be some agreement on terminology, right? Some readers of our book asked why we didn't specify a definition of online hate just as some listeners to my talks ask the same questions as you might today. It's not that it's impossible to come up with a definition. I could say the following. Online hate is a form of expression, words, pictures, music, and videos that takes place online on the internet and social media with the purpose of attacking a person or group on the basis of, of attributes such as race, religion, ethnic origin, sexual orientation, disability, or gender. Now that dry definition sounds a lot like the terms of service or community standards used by online platform. But the definition doesn't begin to convey the scope of hate on the internet or give it any real meaning. So I was thinking maybe this is the way to define online hate and bear with me because the list is long. Online hate is anti-Semitism. Online hate is cyberbullying. Online hate is cyberstalking. Online hate is cyber harassment. Online hate is doxing. Online hate is swatting. Online hate uses deep fakes. Online hate is Holocaust denial. 
Online hate is the pollution of mean-spirited and off-topic comments appended to legitimate online articles. Online hate includes the promotion of white supremacist merchandise on shopping sites. Online hate is right-wing anti-immigrant sentiment on social media sites that leads to violent crimes against immigrants. Online hate is speech that spurs attacks on minorities and civil wars around the globe. Online hate is the radicalization of young people. Online hate is the recruitment by extremist groups. Online hate is the product of anonymity where people do and say things they would never say with attribution. Online hate is harassment and intimidation that affects lives and sometimes silences people online and offline. Online hate is the propagation of stereotypes and lies about minority groups. Online hate includes falsehoods that poison the minds of young people for all of their lives. Online hate scares and scars people with lifelong effects. And as we learned on January 6th, online hate includes propagations of lies that lead to violent insurrection. That definition of online hate is a mouthful. And even as comprehensive as it may seem, it really doesn't begin to encompass the breadth of online hate. For example, I didn't mention the online conduct that drove college student Tyler Clementi to jump, to jump off the George Washington Bridge nor did I mention the epidemic of revenge porn. Sadly, the examples go on and on. One of the roadblocks to precisely defining online hate is that hate speech often depends on context. For example, Nazi propaganda posted by an anti-Semitic white supremacist group easily fits into the category of hate speech. While that same content posted by a college professor teaching World War II and the Holocaust would not be classified as hate speech. Deborah Lipstadt, the preeminent scholar on its anti-Semitism, anti -Semitism, has observed that there is no reason to be frustrated by the fact that you can't quite define anti-Semitism. She said, quoting, Most, much of the general public can't define it. Even scholars in the field can't agree on the precise definition. In fact, there are people, particularly Jews, who eschew definitions and argue that Jews can feel anti-Semitism in their bones the same way that African-Americans can recognize racism and gays can recognize homophobia. She likened this to the famous comment by Justice Stewart about hard hardcore pornography, I know it when I see it. Of course, that won't suffice as a definition that online platforms can use in their community standards or terms of use. Often social media platforms are faced with, when, uh, are faced with deciding when criticism of Israel amounts to anti-Semitism. Criticism of Israel, of course, is not in and of itself anti-Semitic. People are free to criticize any country's actions or policies, even in harsh ways. Israelis themselves criticize their country all the time. However, there are circumstances where criticism crosses the line into anti-Semitism, and you can tell by the context in which the remarks occur. Perhaps the most well-known test of when criticism of Israel crosses the line into anti-Semitism uh, was set forth by Natan Sharansky, the former Deputy Prime Minister of Israel, with whom I have the honor of working on a project for the Interparliamentary Coalition to Combat Anti-Semitism. Sharansky famously devised the 3D test, demonization, double standards, and delegitimization. And as he explained it, the first D is the test of demonization, when the Jewish state is being demonized, when Israel's action are blown out of all sensible proportion, when comparisons are made between Israelis and Nazis, between Palestinian refugee camps in Auschwitz, this is anti-Semitism, not legitimate criticism of Israel. The second D is the test of double standards. When criticism of Israel is applied selectively, when Israel is singled out by the United Nations for human rights abuses, when the behavior of known and, and major abusers, such as China, Iran, Cuba, and Syria is ignored, when Israel's Magan David Adom alone among the world's ambulance services is denied admission to the International Red Cross, that's anti-Semitism. And the third D is the test of delegitimization. When, when Israel's fundamental right to exist is denied alone among all peoples in the world, that too is anti-Semitism. Still, even with the application of the 3D test, even that application poses challenge for platforms making decisions about whether criticism of Israel constitutes hate that violates their community standards or terms of service. Perhaps the platform should consider who the speaker is, that is whether the user has a record of spewing online or offline hate. And it makes sense for the platform to consult with experts such as ADL to understand the complete context for criticism 
uh, criticisms of Israel. The fact that it's, that it's difficult to precisely and comprehensively define online hate, and that it often depends on context, is why policing is so difficult. There is no hate filter that can be downloaded to one's computer to keep out offensive material on the internet. Unlike with copyrighted content and child pornography that has been hashed for detection across the internet, defining hate speech very often is subjective. And that's why Facebook employs more than 50,000 monitors worldwide to evaluate users' complaint, uh, complaints about improper content. Beyond defining online hate is the, is the issue of what kind of impact is online hate having today? We've seen how hate groups use the internet to indoctrinate, recruit, and rally their followers. Again, the January 6th insurrection of the Capitol is a fresh and dramatic example. But beyond the use of the internet as a collaborative tool for haters, a recent ADL survey showed that nearly 30% of Americans reported experienced severe online hate and harassment, including sexual harassment, stalking, physical threats, swatting, doxing, or sustained harassment. Individuals from mar marginalized groups reported feeling less safe online last year than in the past. And this was particularly evident on Facebook, where 77% of users reported being harassed more than on any other platform. It's probably stating the obvious, but a, but a piece of online hate hidden in, obs in obscurity on the internet does, does little to no harm. But that same content recommended in search results and otherwise syndicated across the internet has far greater harmful potential. And so it's heartening to learn of experiments by the platforms involving AI and other techniques to alter the prominence of uh, or the trending nature of posts so that posts remain online but not easily found by the ordinary user. But as the platforms step up their roles as online moderators to eliminate uh, online hate, an age-old concern has reemerged. What process are they using in applying their terms of, of use uh, and, and community standards? And I'll skip, skip over a little bit here about how there needs to be more transparency and needs to be uh, more clarity about how these standards are used in applying the community standards and the terms of use uh, to content. Going forward, greater transparency would promote greater confidence in the process in which hate speech is defined and removal is, occurs or is, is denied. I wanted to mention a few words about the Facebook court-like oversight board, which is referred to as its Supreme Court, because two of the cases decided just last week involved hate speech removals by Facebook. One was upheld, one decision of Facebook was upheld, removing a Russian post that demeaned Azerbaijani people. But surprisingly, the oversight board overturned a decision involving a post in Myanmar, where a military coup is taking place, uh, concluding that the post wasn't necessarily offensive. But what they clearly overlooked is that posts uh, 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 directed at, at the Rohingya Muslims had been used, have been used as an excuse in the genocide occurring against the Rohingya Muslims. So it's, it's surprising that the oversight board did not uphold Facebook's decision there. Uh, now, as promised, I wanna talk just for a moment about one environment where hatred and harassment is growing, but often neglected, and that is in the area of, of uh, online gaming. There are uh, something like 200 million people, 64% of American adults who regularly play online games. And like other social platforms, interactions within uh, video games can be enriching, but also very harmful. Uh, a, a recent ADL survey showed uh, that 95% of, uh, of adults of, uh, uh, age 18 to 45, excuse me, who played online multiplayer games in the US had positive experiences. But despite that positive news, it showed that 81% had experienced some form of harassment and some of it was severe to the extent that people never went back online to play games. 68% of online multiplayer gamers experienced that severe abuse, including physical threats, stalking, and the sustained harassment. This is up from an earlier, an earlier uh, survey. Uh, I'm watching my time because I wanna to get to the panel in, in uh, one second. Um, let me just mention uh, briefly before turning to the panel, the online hate index that the ADL has worked on with the help of the Berkeley uh, D-Lab. This is the use of AI and the use of correlations that shows uh, how online hate is spreading uh, across the internet and by whom. 
uh, and correlations are used to identify hate speech in ways that had not been done. Uh, if you want to learn more about that, uh, I guess I'll direct you to uh, uh, to the ADL website because my time is short and the time for the panel has now uh, arrived. I want to thank you for, for listening me, to me at the start of uh, today's program. And now let's uh, turn to our panelists who I will ask to turn on your cameras and to unmute yourself. Um, and uh, also remind the audience that uh, we will uh, be entertaining your questions in about uh, half an hour or so, uh, so uh, or 45 minutes. So please uh, be thinking of questions or be sending them in. And, and now I want to uh, introduce our panelists by asking them to introduce themselves. So Carrie, I'll ask you to start. We'll go to Vlad next and then we'll finish with Danielle and then we'll be off to the races. Sure. Hi everyone. Thanks, Chris. Um, it was, that was fascinating listening to you. Um, my name is Carrie Goldberg and I'm a civil litigator out of Brooklyn and um, we fight um, for victims' rights and many, many of our cases involve uh, tech facilitated harms. And I'm also the author of a book that came out in 2019 that talks about my cases in my firm uh, called Nobody's Victim, Fighting Psycho Stalkers, Pervs and Trolls. Thanks, Vlad. Thanks, Chris. Uh, and thanks everyone for being here. Thanks to uh, Berkeley for organizing this really important discussion. My name is Vlad Heiken. I'm the National Director of Programs on Anti-Semitism for ADL. Um, I'm also a former refugee from uh, state-sanctioned anti-Semitism in, in the former Soviet Union. Um, and before the founding of the ADL Center on Technology and Society, I was uh, one of the chief uh, liaisons to the tech se sector for ADL. Thanks. All right. And so last I'm, but certainly not least is Danielle. I'm Danielle Citrin. I'm a law professor at the University of Virginia School of Law and the author of um, a 2014 book on cyber stalking called Hate Crimes in Cyberspace. And I've had the great fortune of serving on Chris. We've been longtime friends and I am a mentee of Chris's, but I have really the great honor of serving on the Interparliamentary Task Force Against Cyber Hate that Chris co-led with um, a UK parliamentarian and it was just an, an amazing experience and we've been on this like journey for a really long time together and so you have my deep and abiding admiration Chris. You were you were much too kind and I remember us uh, going on in, into the parliament and and hearing John Mann who was my co-chair of that uh, task force uh, take to the floor of the parliament in, in ways that only British parliamentarians can and, uh, and decry the, the state of yeah. online anti-Semitism. All right, let me go first to, to Carrie and, and wonder if you can, uh, you mentioned you're a civil litigator and wonder if you could talk about uh, some of the more serious situations that you've handled in this area. Sure. Um, so, you know, what I think is really interesting about how the law has developed uh, when it comes to internet harms is that almost everything has been conflated um, by the law into, into speech. And they've, um, our judges, particularly when it comes to conduct that's happening on the platform, have just interpreted, um, you know, even conduct to, to be speech. Um, and, you know, I, I actually feel that, especially as we're dealing with Section 230, which immunizes platforms, uh, there is a really important distinction between conduct and, and, and speech. Um, content-based harms online. Um, so some of the, um, the more difficult cases that I've had involve, um, you know, I don't even know if it would be called hate speech as much as it is just evil hatred um, toward, toward my victims um, that I represent. Um, one case involves, um, a, I, I represent a mom whose 17 year old daughter uh, uh, was murdered um, on social media live. Um, it was, her murder was live posted on social media. And now a year and a half later, the mom and the daughter are completely continuously inundated with uh, pictures of, of the girl's corpse uh, that trolls sent to her. Um, the the uh, daughter's page on, on the social media platform went from having 2,000 followers to having 166,000 followers. And the, the comments on the, that page are always being updated by 
just the most gory, grisly um, content imaginable. And the platform won't give the estate of this girl back um, this this asset, which you know, at this is is the the platform. Um, so that's you know that's a really um, kind of novel new case that I'm I'm developing right now. Um, one of the better known cases that I've dealt with is um, is the the case of Matthew Herrick v. Grinder, where our client was being impersonated by his ex on the gay dating app Grinder, and his ex was. Uh, using Matthew's picture and his location to direct strangers to Matthew's home and to his job, um, all of whom believed that they were going to be fulfilling um, Matthew's rape fantasies and um, that it was an, a, a consensual thing. But um, over 1,200 men came in person. Um, so, so often when we talk about um, crimes and harms that are facilitated through tech, we you know, use cyber cyber stalking or, or, you know, it's an internet harm or, or online harassment or something. But, you know, there's a real offline correlation to this. Um, these people were coming in person and um, the, the platform uh, didn't have the technology they told us to exclude an abusive user. And um, and so then we, we um, commenced a big litigation and, and Danielle was really helpful in, in letting us come to her class when we were um, uh, doing some moot, moot arguments and stuff. And um, it was based on products liability, basically saying, hey, mm. it's an arithmetic certainty that if you are in the business of, of um, creating a, a dating app and don't have the ability to exclude a, a user, then, then you know, you've de designed a dangerous product. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. But there's, we've, we've had, you know, hundreds of, of, of clients and everyone's um, hell is unique and, and, and painful. Well, you, and I imagine you have to serve as not only as lawyer, but also a social worker and psychologist in, in helping them yeah, deal with their, and their stress. Thankfully, yeah, thankfully, my background is as a community worker for five years for Holocaust survivors. Um, and so there's just so much social work that we're doing. And it's amazing what you do. Thank you for, for, for what you do. And Danielle, let me turn to you because it's related. You've, you, you were really one of the first to, to get into this field of understanding the, the scope and extent of, uh, of these hate crimes in cyberspace, as you call it. So maybe you can maybe trace the evolution of of these offenses uh, alongside the, the work that you've been doing? So, you know, um, just thinking back, of course, the earliest, you know, bulletin boards, you know, were used, of course, to rally white supremacists and, all, and to target specific individuals. So I'm thinking, Chris, your definition in which you gave so many examples, not a definite, you know, how you corralled all those examples helped us see the kind of range of, of activity that we might understand as hate speech, which most narrowly, some of your examples were the targeting of specific individuals, right? From protected groups or not, but, but targeted cruelty and demeaning speech, right? To sort of more hostile environments, you gave examples of, to, to speech that, an activity that demeans, that stigmatizes, right? And undermines delegitimizes, right? The sort of broader range from, from really narrow focused on individuals to sort of broader messages about, um, and demeaning messages about groups. And so, you know, we saw that in the early internet that I began studying um, in, I guess, 2004 and 2005, you know, the, there was a, a history um, uh, of, of course, white supremacists using bulletin boards to do all of those things, right? To spread demeaning messages about blacks and Jews, but also to specifically target individuals. So I'm thinking of that famous Southern Poverty Law Center case uh, against um, that they brought on behalf of Bonnie Juhari, uh, an activist, uh, a fair housing activist um, who had a biracial son, um, or sorry, biracial daughter, and was targeted by neo-Nazis in part on bulletin boards, but also on websites. And they specifically targeted Bonnie and her daughter 
and put up um, sort of um, images, doctored images of, of Mr. Hari with a noose beside her neck, calling on people to come confront her offline. And so, you know, this history that, that you talked about, Chris, is from the most narrow targeting of specific individuals that's meant to terrorize and to cause people to confront you offline, as Carrie underscored, right? Um, to more general messages of hate, demeaning hate has been around, right? Since the beginning of bulletin boards, since the beginning of those early UNC researchers establishing Usenet, right, boards. And the same is true, I think, for the work that I focused on, which is, um, of course, hate speech, but often involving women and sexual minorities. And, you know, you saw that in the earliest message boards where um, Julian Dibble wrote about like rape in cyberspace, you know, where it was truly text based, just, you know, uh, acting out of rape that is through words that caused a great disruption on an early bulletin board uh, and kicking out of a user because the person who was being attacked with images created through sort of like literal text, not actual images. And she explained that she felt like she, you know, was hostile and terrifying that she was being literally raped. And so what I began studying, you know, you asked Chris, like, trace this lineage, right? Like how I got involved in 2006, when I began sort of focusing on the targeting of women and minorities online, we saw early like message boards, like auto admit, um, uh, and, uh, and other like websites that were group websites that we saw the targeting of specific individuals. Again, the same kind of story, right? Where you had Kathy Sierra, who is a programmer who wrote about how to creatively write code, right? She was targeted on a message board um, with various sort of troll-like names, um, you know, the message boards themselves. But what they did was create images of Kathy, beautiful blonde woman, right? With a noose beside her neck that said, the only thing Kathy Sarah is good for is for, for being hung. And also they doctored photographs in which her face was covered, like looked like red lingerie, right? And she was terrified. And she called the Colorado police and they were like, this sounds pretty scary, but there's nothing we can do. She canceled a very big, she's a very famous, you know, programmer and very sought after speaker in Silicon Valley. She canceled a big talk that she was giving in, in San Francisco and she basically retreated. Right. Now, you know, I, I interviewed Kathy for my book um, and we like, stayed in close touch and it took her years and years to finally emerge because not only was these set of actors tormenting her, but neo-Nazis, now famous neo-Nazis, right, went after her and, you know, she had wrote about her experience and how it was, she was so frightened and scared. And they then targeted her with doxing. This is another your example, Chris, right? Um, publishing her social security number, her home address and saying, cry baby Kathy Sierra should be raped and murdered, right? And so it was like a whole second order of trolling because she spoke out against her abuse. She was uh, again victimized and it lived such a long life, you know, as I've been studying this for so long online um, and she's disappeared. I wish I could say that, you know, Kathy Sierra has come back and found her voice, especially because there's so many of us who are behind her, um, but she hasn't, right? And, you know, at the same time, 2007, when I started writing about what I called cyber mobs, um, we saw the targeting of, of female law students on a message board called auto admit. And it was the same idea, right? Both misogyny, so like targeting, you know, talking about demeaning messages about women, right? And, and sexual minorities, but of course, then picking out specific law students at Yale, Vandy, BU, you know, you, Fordham, uh, NYU, and then making sort of devoting threads to the targeting of those women. Um, you know, publishing where they lived, where they worked over the summer and calling on people to call the law firms and say why they shouldn't have jobs. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, that sort of began my work in this area in which I called these, this kind of mobbing, which was a perfect storm of, you know, threats, defamation, doxing, so the publication of nude photos in some respects, right. but different kinds of privacy invasions. Um, and usually a perfect storm of all that, sometimes DDoS attacks, right? But the whole thing was designed to shove people offline, silence them and ruin their lives, right? Terrify them. And, you know, I called for us to think about this inspired by a lot of our conversations, Chris, as a civil rights 
problem. You were my first reviewer of cyber civil rights, remember in 2008 I, at the privacy law. This yes. is like my memory lane love ode to Chris was my commenter on the first article they wrote on this called cyber civil rights in 2008. Um, and, you know, at the time, Chris, you'll remember that I proposed amending section 230 in that article, right, using a duty of care. And, and, golly, and that, did seemed, I get that seemed raised. outrageous at the time, right? Yes, literally, I was accused. Chris was like credibly warm and encouraging and was like, I really like this paper. This is what I would do to it. And we had people in the audience saying that I wanted to jail communists. You know, like I was the enemy of the internet. And, and you were going to kill the internet. Right. Yes, I was going to wreck it, right? So it turns out I didn't. But, um, <laughs> um, you know, so this problem is a long standing one. And what I, I think been really gratifying doing this work over all these years. Now, my newest work is on intimate privacy and understanding it and protecting it um, and how it's under threat is that we've changed a lot of hearts and minds. Like what was crazy, what we were saying, you know, um, all of us on this panel, right, right, 12 years ago is now we're not so crazy, right? And, but I think, you know, we've seen, just to wrap it up, sorry, I'm talking so long, but, but you know, what we've seen, you know, since 2016 is the mainstream of hate in a way that when Helen Norton and I wrote a piece in 2011 called Intermediaries and Hate Speech, right. and we tried to offer definitions of hate speech, remember when we had that, um, we had meetings with tech companies to convince them to be clear about what those definitions are with examples and they didn't listen to us, right? But you know what we're seeing is now the mainstream, it's, I mean, goodness, everywhere. In fact, it's, it's storming the Capitol. So, you know, I but, think it's- But we're not getting a lot of pleasure out of saying, see, I told you so. Oh, golly, no, 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 no. I wish, you know, Vlad's in a growth business. You know, like I wish, you know, right. in your work on anti-Semitism, I wish, Glad that wasn't the case. And poor Carrie, she barely like can turn her phone off because she has so many clients calling her 24 um, seven. Do you know what I'm saying? But I wish that wasn't the case, but you know, here we are. Right, right. Well, I'm happy that that you and the rest of the panel are still engaged because if, if we were, you know, crying in the wilderness for so many years and people are listening because they're seeing dramatic examples like January 6th as a, as a manifestation of, of what's going on. So Vlad, I wanna to turn to you. Uh, in 2019, ADL recorded the highest number of anti-Semitic incidents on record in the United States history. Uh, and, and the year prior to that, we witnessed the deadliest act of anti-Semitic anti mass violence in the US history in Pittsburgh at the Tree of Life shooting. Um, in, in your view, what accounts for the surge in anti-Semitism, which is of course the oldest hatred, uh, and what's the role of social me media in all of this? Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, well, yeah, as uh, Danielle said, you know, uh, this is a growth industry. I always uh, say that uh, I and my colleagues at ADL go to work every day to try to put ourselves out of a job, uh, but unfortunately, we have uh, very good job security. Um, you know, uh, I think there's a number of things that we can discuss when we talk about the, the surge of anti-Semitism that you mentioned. Um, there's sort of, I would put it in two buckets, right? There's um, what could be called perhaps semi-organic drivers, cyclical uh, trends. Um, and then there's uh, non-organic, uh, non-cyclical drivers of that as well. So on the more cyclical or organic uh, side, um, what we tend to see historically is that during times of tremendous anxiety and uh, social uncertainty, um, you know, that could be caused by economic anxiety, rapid technological, social, um, or demographic or other types of changes, political instability, civil unrest, uh, e ecological crises, pandemics right, wars, um, all of those tend to heighten anxieties. Um, and what happens is people begin to circle their wagons and begin to ask who is one of us uh, and therefore pro probably safe and who is one of them uh, and a potential source of that threat. Right, and um, so we see the, the correlations with uh, surges in anti-Semitism around these times as people uh, begin to try to identify the source of the, the threat that they're facing, the, uh, the, the suffering that they're undergoing, economic or other uh, forms of, uh, of difficulties. Um, and so, you know, uh, they're, you know, instead of trying to understand the complex phenomena that lead to these outcomes, uh, economic trends, for example, uh, you know, uh, ecological trends, Trends. 
Rather, it's much simpler to uh, to get to buy into a conspiracy theory, which neatly organizes all of these complex phenomena and gives you an easy answer uh, that our economic troubles are just due to a secret cabal of Jews that are manipulating markets, controlling the banks, etc. You don't need to understand economics. You don't need to understand physics or, or principles of uh, uh, of environmental science um, to understand that uh, there is a threat that is posed by a particular group. Now, on the other side, uh, in, or in the other bucket, I would say there's um, also non-organic drivers of these, not caused by sort of these, uh, you know, global, social, uh, economic, or other phenomena. Um, they're driven by uh, by human drivers, right? Um, you know, anti-Semitism has long been used uh, historically as a uh, as a political tool, right? Demagogues seize upon and exploit collective anxieties that I just mentioned um, in order to advance certain political or other agendas, right? Um, and that includes, by the way, both uh, state actors and non-state actors, right? So, um, and we're seeing both of these uh, kinds of things operative today. So, um, and where it comes to, I think, uh, you know, where it's different today is that, um, you know, as I said, uh, you know, we've seen uh, all of these things historically manifest. You, you mentioned, um, you know, uh, the propaganda that was uh, mobilized, uh, you know, under the Nazi regime. And I think that's uh, quite apt. Um, what I would say is that uh, the techniques that were used by the Nazis, um, by the propaganda machine of the, of the Third Reich, uh, to lay the foundation for the Holocaust are being employed today to indoctrinate young people. Um, but it's being done with greater efficiency, with greater immediacy, and at a much greater scale, right? Uh, and in, in a very much a, a decentralized uh, type of way. So a number of uh, years ago, um, uh, excuse me. So actually, it was it was probably about uh, three years ago or, or so now. Um, somebody leaked the um, the playbook of the Daily Stormer, right? Which mm -hmm. is uh, one of the uh, sort of most popular white supremacist, anti-Semitic, racist, uh, uh, homophobic sites on the internet, right? Um, and in there, they laid out the ways in which they're using uh, internet technologies, internet culture, um, and so on, in order to indoctrinate young people uh, towards a explicitly uh, violent and genocidal agenda, right? So they talk about the ways in which, um, uh, you know, the, the, the we, that they hijack uh, existing culture and hide their messaging within that culture. They use pop culture, uh, pop music and entertainment um, and attach to it these ideas of Nazism and white supremacy to remove it from the realm of weirdness as they call it and make it more palatable, make it more mainstream, right? He says um, that packing our messages inside uh, existing cultural memes and humor can be viewed as a delivery method, something like adding cherry flavor to children's medicine, right? And the goal is to continually repeat the same points over and over and over again. He says, people are first drawn in by curiosity or the naughty humor and are slowly awakened to reality by, uh, um, uh, by reading the same points over and over again. And we're able to keep these uh, points fresh uh, by applying them to current events, right? Um, so, so let me just interrupt because related to that is the kind of absence in the curricula of school systems, uh, the absence of courses on cyber literacy, on how to filter information that students are absorbing online and also how to behave online so that they confront this, this indoctrinating material uh, with, with the cherry flavor uh, and they really don't know how to digest it or whether they should be tasting it even. Uh, and it's a problem that persists. If you go to Canada, they have a robust curricula on, on the internet and on cyber hate for kids. And uh, I haven't seen studies on how effective it is, but at least it exists and they're giving it a try. And Absolutely. Mike, I wonder if you share my concern about you know, the absence of that counterweight to the, to the uh, material that you just described. Oh, I, I absolutely share your concern. I mean, you know, um, I'm I'm very concerned about uh, what young people today are uh, are learning. What you know, the way I think about this is that young people today have a sort of IV in their arm, a steady drip of extremist content with which they're being indoctrinated on a daily basis. Right? Um, propaganda works through repetition. Right? That's literally what a meme is: endless iterations on a theme. 
right? And so when people are being told over and over and over and over and over again on a daily basis in their in their uh, social media feeds that the Jews are controlling the banks, the Jews want to harm you, they want to undermine our, our national interests, um, they're foreign agents, they have allegiances to foreign governments, they're pushing censorship, they're pushing pornography, they're pushing degeneracy over and over and over again. Um, and, it's, and all of this is buttressed, by the way, by thousands of years of uh, anti-Semitic conditioning that pervades all of our institutions, uh, our movies, our, 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 you know, our media, et cetera, um, that, uh, that this uh, only reinforces the, the ideas that are already a, sort of an undercurrent in our society. Great, thank you. Carrie, I wanna go back to you and, um, and discuss for a moment a, a, a project of the Anti-Defamation League, I guess it was last year, but I will have to refresh my recollection as to, I think it was last year, called Backspace Hate. And it was, it was addressed to uh, enacting laws at the state level that would address the kinds of things that you and Danielle described of uh, the, the doxing, swatting, uh, re, you know, revenge porn, that sort of thing to try to get laws passed at the state level. And I wonder whether you, what, what your sense is of how effective uh, state law remedies are and related to that, how knowledgeable are lawmakers and law enforcers uh, about what's going on uh, with the use of technology? Um, I, I was um, kind of pro, um, involved a little bit with, with the, um, the Backspace hate campaign and um, I thought it was, it was tremendous. Um, I mean, I think the biggest challenge that we face with legislation is just the lobbying um, issue, which is that usually the uh, lobbyists on the other side are big tech and funded by big tech. And the, um, you well, know- Let me versus... stop you for a second though. Big, big tech certainly can't say they're in favor of hate or in favor of harassment. So what, what's in it for them uh, to, to oppose uh, efforts to curtail this? Well, they, they will very much say that they are not in favor of hate. I agree with right. you, but okay. they are, um, they're very opposed to any sort of uh, regulation or any anything that would require that they um, moderate content according to A, B, C, or D. Uh, they're terrified um, about uh, individuals um, having the right to hold them liable. It's the only industry um, sort of in the history of the world that um, gets this amazing immunity from liability as, as a business owner. Uh, myself, like, yeah, yeah. Um, I think they heard they, you and, uh, they, and and turned your phone upside down. <laughs> it's it's the, the wizards at Zoom. Um, uh, as a business owner myself, you know, I'm very aware of of um, the risk of liability. And you know what? It just, you know, between like just being an ethical and moral person, and um, and the, you know, it's just like that pressure on industries to be held liable for harms that that you you create like is is a very strong one and i i can i can attest to that um you know i think that uh there's there's a tremendous meeting of the minds between libertarians um first amendment um absolutists and tech when it comes to anything that that touches the internet. Uh, Danielle and I saw that so much when it came to non-consensual porn um, legislation that fortunately, you know, overcame so much resistance. So we're treading a little bit into the area of the second symposium and I don't wanna, I don't wanna step on their headlines. Okay. So, but I wanna ask you how receptive do you think uh, law enforcement is to learning about in sort of the scope of what's going on on the internet. That when you, when you go to um, a prosecutor or an investigator to, on behalf of your client, you know, are they knowledgeable? Do they need to get, do they need to be better educated about, about the scope of, of uh, what's going on? Online crimes are not um, popular ones among our law enforcers because uh, especially when it, it comes to um, online harassment, revenge porn, um, where the, the offender is anonymous or where there might be a mob of people each playing you know a small role you might have 10,000 10, people all tweeting one thing that's not harassment if it's not an individual creating a course of conduct and and um you know 
going after one person still leaves the other 9,999 who are still doing the harassment. So um, it's, it's, a, it's a real problem. Um, plus, you know, the, the offender might be on the other side of the world from where the law enforcer is. If this is a, a misdemeanor or not a serious felony, it's, they know that they're not going to be, you know, extraditing somebody for, um, for, for hate speech. It's, it's very rare. On the other side, I'll say that, um, you know, we have some superstars um, that take tremendous risks, um, particularly in the uh, DOJ's computer crime intellectual property part who've, who've right. um, litigated some, some of our most, most serious um, cyber harassment and cyber stalking crimes. Um, including one where our offender was just sentenced to 17 and a half years of, um, of time. Um, so, you know, it varies based on where you are, but the, you know, just if, if you're the victim of, of an online harm, not most likely if you go to your local precinct to report it, you're gonna be turned away. And it, it takes a lot of advocacy and speaking to the right people who have the right connections who had stand a chance of getting anything um, uh, criminally prosecuted. So just like kids need to be more cyber li literate, so do uh, law enforcement officers, huh? Yeah. Totally. So Danielle, you have, you have some thoughts in response to what Carrie just said? I know, I, I just wanted to note that that's why, you know, so I've, I've seen firsthand and written about law enforcement's social attitudes, which is both, it's no big deal, boys will be boys, but also they need a ton of education. So. <laughs> Um, having worked, written about it and, and worked on it myself, that we, we have a long way to go, uh, right? But that's why Kate, uh, Carrie's creativity, like seeing that this, I'm thinking Carrie of your Herrick case, you know, you, you, you hit a wall, right? You had an order, you know, an order of protection and no one was enforcing it. And then you were like, look, we gotta be creative here. There are gatekeepers who are facilitating harm and no one's doing anything about it. And so your creativity, like you are pushing the boundaries, right, Carrie, with the Herrick litigation. And you're like, mm -hmm. uh-uh, you know, you were so frustrated and you're, you just leveraged all your creativity to come up with a theory that I'm convinced of, but I wish the, you know, we just got to change the law now, as you, as you always say, right? Forget litigation, but, but you keep trying. Right. And it's just, I think that, you know, creativity was so important after you face frustration, you're like, I'm not going to give up. <laughs> right. Uh, and it's just, it's, it's resoundingly frustrating. It's, you know, I, I, we've seen this together, Carrie and I, you know, since we've been working together and been friends for a really long time. So it's just like hit your head against the wall and it's led to some really creative efforts that I wish for more fruit. Right. Carrie, like we were hoping with Herrick, it might, but we're gonna, you know, so bless that we're trying, but it's but it's, it's, it's endemic. Know, it's, it, in, you know. in fact, you all are creating a common law of online offenses. Uh, and you know, as I said in my 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 talk, you can't have a precise definition. It really right. it depends on context, it depends on the particular circumstances. And as with the common law, it will expand to to address new circumstances. So uh, both of yeah. you, you know, deserve uh, our, our applause for, for that. I want to go ask Vlad one more question, and then we'll go to questions from, uh, from the audience. Uh, and Vlad, my question has to do with Holocaust denial. It took, you know, an awful long time for Facebook to recognize Holocaust denial as prohibited anti-Semitism. And that's not for one of trying by the, by the ADL. And they did, I think, was it last year, Mark Zuckerberg finally... Um, uh, relented and, and and included Holocaust denial as one of the prohibited uh, areas uh, of content. Uh, but I suspect, and you can talk about this, Holocaust denial as a form of anti-Semitism uh, has not gone away just because Mark Zuckerberg says it's prohibited by their terms of service, right? No, not at all. Um, I actually wanted to, to comment uh, on something that um, was raised a little earlier, which is this notion yeah, of protect, protecting the internet. Um, right, there's, uh, I think there's something that gets lost here. I mean, certainly, I think there's a, a tremendous interest among all of us in protecting the internet as a, um, as an incredible means of for the interchange of ideas, right. 
Um, but there's a, a sort of a, a lopsided approach to this where people think that all we have to do is sort of prevent the government imposition of censorship on the exchange of these ideas in order to protect uh, the internet for, uh, as a means of, um, of communication in this way. Well, what happens if you are a young woman uh, who is posting um, about uh, misogyny and sexism in gaming, and as a result of, the, uh, of, this, um, uh, of this blogging, and, and um, uh, you get daily you know, uh, death and rape threats, right? At some point, that harassment and intimidation might lead you to decide, you know what, it's not worth it. I'm gonna protect my mental health uh, and I'm gonna log off. And, and as you said, Chris, we've seen this, the research bears this out, that people who are subjected to harassment online on a regular basis, oftentimes change uh, their behavior online, oftentimes leaving the platforms, leaving the gaming environments um, that where they're getting harassed. So uh, we have to think about it from both ends that you know, on the one hand, yes, it's important to prevent a uh, government position of, of censorship and limitation of, uh, uh, of for the for expression on the other hand we also have to think about the effects of you know creating an anything goes environment where people are harassed off of these platforms and the, as, as a result we all lose out on those ideas right so if we're interested in protecting the interchange of ideas we have to protect it from both angles now where where it comes to um to the Holocaust, your question on the, on the Holocaust. So we this is something that we worked uh, with Facebook on for a very long time, uh, trying to convince them um, that Holocaust denial was a form of anti-Semitism. Um, and as many scholars uh, sort of have affirmed, Holocaust denial is actually the final act of genocide, right? You erase a people, erase a culture, uh, and then erase the erasure itself, right? Um, and so, you know, we, we try to uh, sort of, um, you know, uh, in, you know, in part to, to Facebook, the, the fact that, you know, it's not simply historical inaccuracy, which is how they had perceived this, you know, it, our terms of service don't, you know, uh, don't include uh, posting of historical inaccuracies, which is how they viewed Holocaust denial. But Holocaust denial isn't merely uh, sort of a, uh, a uh, misunderstanding of the facts. It's a willful um, negation of a his, one of the most you know rec studied and, and recorded um, and documented events in history. So yeah, last year you know after mounting public pressure, Facebook announced this this policy change uh, that they would relent and finally uh, sort of have a policy banning Holocaust denial on their platform. In the months that have followed, um, unfortunately, the the imposition of that policy has not led to a significant change of the environment with, with regards to um, with uh, regards to the Holocaust denial on Facebook. We recently released a uh, on Holocaust Remembrance Day a scorecard uh, that looks at the ways uh, the prevalence of a Holocaust denial on various platforms. Facebook got very low marks; it got a, a grade of D, right? Um, other platforms that don't have an explicit Holocaust denial policy, such as Twitter, actually did a lot better, which tells us that, you know, having a policy is not enough. You need to actually be serious. There has to be actual, uh, the will to enforce these policies, and there have to be uh, mechanisms in order to uh, effectively do that, right? So a policy is, is insufficient. Um, and we hope that, you know, uh, Facebook does a, actually a better job and, and, and you know, puts uh, real concrete actions um, that have a, uh, a, a measurable, measurable effect um, in terms of enforcing these Holocaust denial policies that they've put in place. So as you know, in, uh, in Europe, uh, there's a memorandum of understanding between a couple of European nations and Facebook that requires Facebook to take down uh, uh, content that violates their, their community standards, such as Holocaust denial. I think it, it's, it's in fact a law in Germany that requires that. Uh, they have to take it down within 24 hours. Um, and so have you, have you uh, taken a look at that and whether there's uh, less uh, Holocaust denial in, in European countries than we see on the Facebook platform in the US? Yeah, I, I think so, you know, um, I think the, 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 the law sort of um, where, where we can say that the law prohibits um, certain kinds of conduct, I think the, the, the internet platforms are much more responsive, right? Because they um, can be held liable, um, uh, legally liable for the things that they are uh, allowing on their platforms. It's, it's actually you know, a matter of criminal activity um, in places like Germany. So um, in, there, there is a, um, a way in which um, there isn't a uniformity of uh, enforcement, a, a uniformity 
of, uh, of the prevalence of these problems uh, across different environments within the social uh, media platforms. All right, thank you. Let me, let me ask you before, before uh, I leave you, Vlad, uh, about the relationship between Islamophobia uh, phobia and anti-Semitism. We've always said that anti-Semitism, people who are anti-Semites typically engage in other types of hatred as well. They're, they're uh, an equal opportunity, they're equal opportunity haters, right? And, and do you find that in your work that, uh, that those who engage in anti-Semitism also are Islamophobes? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, the anti-Semitism is sort of the lingua franca of uh, online conspiracism and, um, and, and bigotry, right? What we see uh, quite often is that anti-Semitism is kind of the canary in the coal mine, right? Uh, famously, UN, uh, former UN ambassador Samantha Power called anti-Semitism the canary in the coal mine, which is to say right. that anti-Semitism never sort of uh, shows up alone, right? Um, it comes with an entourage um, that includes uh, xenophobia, all kinds kinds of other bigotries, uh, misogyny, sexism, homophobia, Islamophobia, um, uh, anti-democratic types of uh, trends, contempt for knowledge, learning, expertise, conspiracy theories, um, et cetera. And so we see a very strong nexus between um, anti-Semitism and Islamophobia in particular, both of which um, have this unique aspect of being a sort of conspiracy theory um, that deals with a threat to national uh, well-being to our culture, our constitution, our way of life, etc. So when you look, for example, um, at the Pittsburgh Tree of Life uh, shooting, when you look at the um, El Paso uh, sh shooting at the Walmart, when you look at the Christchurch shooting uh, at the mosque in Christchurch, um, you know, what you see is uh, the presence of uh, two things. First of all, all of those killers were involved in online communities where they were radicalized and incited to violence. And in all three cases, you see that they were motivated by an anti-Semitic conspiracy theory known as the Great Replacement, which is prevalent. Uh, I would say it's one of the pillars of modern white supremacist ideology, right? This notion that Jews seek to undermine nations by flooding them with people who, quote unquote, don't belong there, right? And that includes uh, Latinos and Hispanics here in the United States. It also includes uh, Syrian uh, Muslim refugees, right? And so we see that in internet um, in these extremist communities, uh, it's, it's quite prevalent, this notion that you will see that Jews are behind um, the influx of uh, Muslim immigrants into Europe uh, as it, under the, the, the pretense that these people are being um, in, you know, introduced to these communities as a way to um, take uh, to resupplant uh, white culture, white civilization, um, and to take white nations away from uh, their rightful, quote unquote, their rightful owners. So absolutely, we need to recognize the, the ways in which anti-Semitism um, feeds off of and drives all of these other forms of bigotry uh, so that we can uh, really understand how to come together to combat it. Um, by the way, the, the people who engage in this stuff are well aware of the power of our communities coming together. They took lessons from the civil rights era um, where they saw that um, communities, black, Jewish, other communities coming together were effectively able to uh, dismantle the legalized form of white supremacy uh, uh, that was operative in the country at the time known as the old Jim Crow. Uh, they took lessons from that. And so today, one of the things that we're seeing is um, endless attempts to sow division between black and Jewish and other communities uh, by creating, for example, fake sock puppet accounts um, that look like they're Jew from, by Jewish people, right? Accounts of Jewish people that then uh, begin posting all kinds of anti-black content in order to set the black community against the Jewish community and vice versa. Right, so they know uh, the power of our coalitions um, and solidarity, and so we should recognize that too. Great, thank you. Let's go to some questions from the audience, and I'll throw this out to the the panel. Anyone who wants to take it, please do, and anyone who wants to comment on it, please do as well. So the question is: Can you describe manifestations of racism against people of color and minorities? Is it like old racism? Does it look different on the internet? Anyone can buzz in. <laughs> Does Vlad want, I mean, I'm happy to bounce in, but. but please, please, go But ahead. I feel, okay. Um, <laughs> I was thinking, you know, the ADL so carefully studies racism online. I think this is just to pick up on Vlad's insight about memification culture that, you know, racism online, I mean, where we have seen it, it's this jokey, this notion that it's a joke and that we're using humor 
it's so insidious. I mean, much in the way that Carrie's case, you know, that she talked about her newest case, the sort of RIP trolling that we see on Facebook, like accounts in which we're trolling people who are, you know, with loved ones, we see that humor which is is diabolical, frankly. You know, using using memes, this particularly to um, um, Black Americans. You know, you you and also just you know people of color generally, um, the sort of memification of hate that is designed to seem like a joke and get young people. And you know, we've seen like this is such or this is so old at this point, but like the use of video game ish sort of you know um, the killing of. Um, you know, black and Latinos are in games now that like white supremacists spread. So they're, they're jumping on everything, especially to get at the younger generation with humor and games and music. Yeah. Let for me, for let me, racism. Uh, yeah. Let me pull another quote from uh, the, the, uh, the piece I cited, uh, the, the sort of uh, playbook of the, the Daily Stormer, right? So the founder of the site says, um, there should be a conscious agenda to dehumanize the enemy to the point where people are ready to laugh at their deaths. So it isn't clear that we are doing this as that would be a turnoff to most normal people. That is the people they want to recruit into this agenda. We rely on the lulls, right? This is internet slang for humor, or lighthearted, ironic content, right? Um, the tone of the site should be light. Most people are not comfortable with material that comes off as uh, vitriolic, raging, non-ironic hatred. This is obviously a ploy and I actually do want to gas kikes. That's the ultimate agenda, right? We, we, we can't sort of be duped by this notion that this is just irony, it's just humor, you know. Uh, ironic hatred and fascism are still racism and hatred and fascism, right? Um, so, you know, we have to be, I think, a little bit more savvy um, than these people who are just, um, you know, constantly saying, oh, it's no big deal, it's just a joke, don't be so uptight. It's not a joke. Uh, fascists with a genocidal agenda are actually using humor and, and uh, funny memes and, and things like that uh, in order to indoctrinate people, again, to the point where people are ready to laugh at the mass murder of uh, people of color, uh, Jews, other sexual gender minorities, et cetera. This is not a joke. Gary, any thoughts? Yeah, um, yeah, and I'll I'll add that um, you know the clients that I represent who are people of color, um, especially young black girls, have um, you know incredible obstacles when it comes to having law enforcement take their cases seriously. Um, that was that's true. You know, you know when you apply it to any sort of gender based crime um, or revenge porn or um, or sexual assault, um, but I both have had huge resistance from law enforcement taking um, seriously their complaints, as well as you know judges. Like I've um, gotten orders of protection. One time, I got an order of protection for a young black girl who whose boyfriend took pictures of her without her consent, broke into her uh, social media accounts, hijacked them, and when we finally got our order of protection from the judge, she went into a just a tirade telling telling my client um you know she not to have let this happen and how could she the pictures were taken without consent um you know so there's there's just a shaming that i don't see with other populations so it's a double whammy of the lack of understanding of how the technology works uh, and and sort of insidious racism mm -hmm. so we had a number of questions relating to anonymity and whether anything is truly anonymous online and can we trace communications and hate speech uh, on the internet? Anybody want to take a crack at that? Go ahead, I'd please. be happy to. <laughs> um, the amazing thing about internet crimes is that, you know, unlike a lot of other crimes, there's actually a trail. And every single communication that, that happens online, whether it's an email, a social media posting, you know, it starts one place and ends another place. And so, what we found is that, um, you know, even the most sophisticated people um, uh, who use anonymizing technology, whether that be VPN, the Tor browser, um, uh, apps like Text Plus or, or anonymous email accounts with overseas um, servers like Tutanoto, um, they always make mistake at one point or another. And usually if you go back far enough to 
um, those communications and, and subpoena the, um, the platforms and cross compare that with the um, internet service providers, sooner or later, <laughs> you will get results. The only issue is that um, unless somebody brings a lawsuit, um, only our law enforcers can actually access that, um, that information. And our technology companies won't hand over the IP information about users. It actually requires the interest of law enforcement, which we've already talked about the, the um, hurdles um, faced, faced there. And it, particularly when there are tons of layers of anonymity, um, that can be very time consuming and, and there's delays and, and just tons of paperwork involved in, in getting the warrants. Vlad, what about encrypted messaging between, um, between and among uh, hate groups? Is there any way to pierce that and, and, uh, and unmask those, those haters? It really depends on the level of sophistication, I think. Um, you know, this is something, as you mentioned, you know, we, we started noticing that uh, internet tech, emerging internet technology, this is pre the internet, right? This is uh, before AOL, this is like bulletin board systems. Um, that, you know, as you said, white supremacists were among the first to sort of understand the power of, of network computers, and they began using it um, for a whole host of uh, purposes, uh, certainly spreading propaganda, um, spreading their ideology and recruiting uh, new folks into uh, into their ideology, into their movements, but also uh, these encrypted communications um, and uh, ability to fund uh, various activities, to organize various activities. So this is something that's been going on um, for many, many years. And I think one of the, you know, these people are sort of uh, adopting with the, uh, just as the enforcement mechanisms uh, adopt to try to deal with the present threat, um, these people are also uh, adopting, uh, you know, new ways to get around uh, the sensors to, to further encrypt their communications. So it's it's a bit like playing whack-a-mole, right? Um, we, we sort of, uh, you know, deal with one issue and already there's a new issue uh, because somebody somehow has already figured out how to get around the, the previous mechanism. So I think this is going to be an ongoing uh, problem. Okay, we have a number of questions about extremists and fundamentalist, fundamentalist groups online, QAnon and the like. How do these groups tie into one another and with other alt-right white supremacist groups, misogynist groups, uh, etc.? Let me turn to Danielle and we'll go to the other panelists. I was thinking that's, that's definitely Vlad territory, but I can say that having, having studied um, men's rights groups since 2007, that what we've seen is the same actors who are involved in the sort of men's rights activism, targeting specific women, journalists and others, like they morphed into, and there are all these interesting studies about this, but the alt-right and then the alt-right sort of subsuming, this is certainly true of 2016. I feel like the work that we did, Chris, with the ADL's task force, you know, the targeting of journalists, right? Um, you know, we saw them morph more generally into white supremacy. So I'm gonna hand it off to Vlad who really knows this stuff, but yeah, but okay. there was like an interesting precursor, you know what I mean, to the to the story with misogyny. Yeah, there's uh, there's actually tremendous overlap among all of these groups. Um, we've even seen, you know, in, in the last few years, uh, communications between uh, sort of white supremacist far right groups here in the United States and Islamist groups uh, around the world, right? So there's there's this uh, sort of international nexus of uh, extremists of all kinds. Um, one of the things uh, I want to shout out uh, my colleagues at the Center on Extremism who put out a report a, a number of years ago um, about this intersection of white supremacy and misogyny, right? Um, it, it's called uh, When Women Are the Enemy. Um, and, and it looks at the ways in which, uh, you know, as Danielle just described, the, the sort of um, cross-pollination of these ideas uh, among all of these extremist communities. Right. So, uh, you know, when you look at uh, something like QAnon, for example, um, you know, this is a conspiracy theory um, or a set of conspiracy theories even um, that sort of uses uh, classical uh, anti-Semitic um, uh, sort of ideas and frameworks, like things drawn directly from the protocols of the learned elders of Zion, which sort of the, so, you know, is, is kind of the modern, the blueprint from modern anti-Semitism. Um, QAnon draws uh, very uh, heavily upon those kinds of ideas that have been sort of part of, um, uh, part of the 
um, you know, cultural uh, framework in the West for, for, for centuries. Um, and so when, you know, Marjorie uh, Taylor Greene, for example, the QAnon, uh, the most prominent QAnon congressperson, um, you know, was talking Hopefully about- Hopefully the Jewish only one. Space lasers. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's Jewish space lasers, right? Um, you know, we're not surprised that sort of this, uh, this person who is, you know, engaged in these conspiracy theories about, you know, uh, a, a dangerous cult of elitists and, and, you know, Hollywood moguls that, you know, abuse children and, and drain them of, you know, a certain, uh, uh, you know, biological uh, you know, adrenochrome and all this stuff. You know, we're not surprised in the slightest that this has now uh, moved into the, the area of explicit anti-Semitism, talking about the Rothschilds and other, you know, anti-Semitic conspiracies. There's a, a tremendous overlap among these communities and there's tremendous uh, cross-pollination of ideas. So we're probably gonna have to stop there. We have a number of other questions and to the questioners, I apologize that we weren't able to get to your questions. Uh, it's, I'm glad to see that there's so much uh, interest uh, in, in the subject. I wanna say thank you uh, profoundly to our panelists. You did a fabulous job as I expected. Uh, it was a great pleasure being your moderator here today. And, and with that, I think I'll turn it back to uh, Ken. Thank you uh, so much, Chris. Uh, and thanks to all of our participants, to Carrie, to Danielle, to Vlad, uh, for what one of the participants called in the Q&A, an awesome session. Um, but also a, a very troubling one and one that um, leaves uh, many more questions, uh, troubling questions than answers. Um, with that, uh, I want to invite you to the second part of the symposium, which happens one month from today, March 4th, uh, at, at the same time, Combating Online Hate, Law, Technology, and Society, which begins to talk about some of the issues uh, that we moved closer to towards the end of our discussion, uh, where to go, what are some of the answers uh, in law, in technology, in society, and, and what are the stumbling blocks. Uh, we hope that you'll be able to attend that. I also want to remind you of uh, MCLE credit, um, which you can find, for which you can find information in the chat, fill out the Google form, uh, and I want to note that the program was recorded uh, and will be available on the website and symposium page soon. So please join me in thanking Chris. Thank you so much for uh, coordinating and spearheading this panel. Uh, Carrie, uh, Danielle, Vlad, thank you for sharing your experiences and your research. And thank you all for joining us. <laughs>